All right, good morning, everyone. Let's take out our Bibles today and turn to Exodus chapter 4. Exodus chapter 4, we're going to be in verse 18 all the way through chapter 5 today. And uh, as you're turning there, if you're new to the church, I'm Nate. I'm the lead pastor here, and I'll be in the Welcome Center after the service if you want to say hello uh, to me. I'd love to meet you. Uh, But I wanted to um, double down on the uh, kids' ministry announcement. It's kind of our fall uh, recruitment season. Uh, It seems that each fall we need to do kind of a new, fresh recruitment, partly because we're adding lots of kids to the church And there's always a little bit of turnover in our children's ministry um, department and servants. And so uh, there is a need there in this coming season. And we would really ask you to pray and consider maybe uh, going to a service and uh, serving at one of the services or maybe every other week serving in the kids ministry. It's a rewarding experience to uh, serve this next generation. And it's one of the most important ministries uh, in the church as far as raising up the next generation, but also uh, ministry to and providing for uh, the families of the church to be able to gather and worship. It's a, it's a huge ministry opportunity, so please uh, consider uh, that ministry. I also wanted to mention to you um, at, that uh, this weekend is the Women's Conference, so this Friday night and Saturday, and I'm really excited about this Women's Conference. And uh, what I wanted to say today is simply that uh, if you have... Uh, kind of thought about it and thought, well, that's not for me. I want to encourage you that uh, if you're a woman, this is something that is for you. And in fact, uh, we've been praying for you specifically uh, if you have dismissed yourself uh, in your heart from being there uh, this weekend. Sometimes we tell ourselves that we're too busy for something like this, but I think that God probably wants to break through and speak to us in the midst of that busyness and uh, craziness or chaos. Sometimes we tell ourselves that we're uh, too young for it. This isn't my group. This is a ladies thing, and I'm not in that stage of life yet, but, but this is something for you. God wants to speak to your heart, or you might say to yourself, I'm too old for something like this. There's going to be all these younger women there that are going to be laughing and playing games and all of that, but no, God wants to speak to you. Some of you might say to yourselves, well, maybe next year I'll have my life together a little bit more. I'll be a little more solid, but the people there are not ready for the hot mess that I would be bringing to the conference this weekend. But that's not true. This is for you. God wants to speak to you. And you might be sitting here saying to yourself, well, I'm doing really good. I don't need that kind of ministry environment. And I would say to you, if that's Do you feel that way? You definitely need to be here uh, this weekend. So I I just am praying for you that you would not easily dismiss this, but really let the Lord give uh, give him that opportunity this uh, Friday night and Saturday. Diane Comer is a gift to the church, and I know you're going to be blessed by the word that she shares this weekend, amongst other things. Uh, Listen, at the top of the service, some of you guys missed it, but Pastor Manny came up on the platform and he prayed for peace in Israel. I'm going to reiterate that prayer as we open up our time uh, in the Word. Lord, we come to you today and we commit our time of studying the Bible into your hands. We pray that you'd speak to us, lead us, teach us. We pray, Lord, for these things coming up, Lord, that you'd flourish our kids' ministry. We pray that you'd bless the women's conference this weekend. And as we prayed earlier from the Psalms, we pray for peace in Israel. Lord, have mercy, we pray. And so, Lord, we come to you today. We thank you for your word here in Exodus, and we pray that you'd speak to us. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. Okay, our plan today is to finish up Exodus chapter 4 and then go all the way through chapter 5. And we're going to take it in three movements, two very short movements at the beginning and then one really long movement at the end. And so we'll have a longer reading near the end of this teaching. Uh, But to start this teaching, I wanted to tell a story about last uh, Christmas. My family and I, we were all gathered together with some extended family, and we were doing a gift exchange. And our our family is uh, pretty orderly when it comes to opening presents. It's not a free-for-all, like everybody all at once kind of thing. But we take turns and all of that. And one of my daughters was opening up a gift from one of her relatives, and uh, it, was, uh, it was a purse or a satchel, like an over-the-shoulder bag that a girl would have, and uh, it was like a knit bag, so you could see through it, you know, you couldn't put little small things because it would kind of fall out, but it was, it was just this cute green knit 
kind of see-through bag. And uh, as she was opening it up and pulling it out, one of her grandfathers across the room, not really realizing what she was opening up and a little bit confused, thought that she was opening up a shirt. And uh, as she's holding it up, he's like thinking to himself, that is a see-through shirt that my granddaughter is uh, getting right now. And so uh, he just without any preamble at all. He just out loud said, nope. That was it. Just nope. Not happening. And I, I had to tell him, like, hey, it's, it's a bag. It's not a, I know you think it's a shirt, but it's just a bag. He's like, oh, okay, that's acceptable. <laughs> what, what, what was the idea there? The idea when he said nope was no granddaughter of mine. You know, you're my granddaughter. I love you. I care about you. And I, I don't want to see you going out in something like that. I know what guys are like, and no thank you, nope, you know, kind of thing. And I think in a similar fashion, uh, what this passage that we're going to read today, it, it shows us that God has a similar heart for his people. Uh, he has, if we're in Christ, given us a new identity in Jesus. We're new creatures in the sight of God with new natures. We've been rescued from the terrors of sin, and we're called to live out the new identity that has been given to us. Not, not to earn the new identity that's been given to us, but from the position that we have in Christ Jesus. That, in a sense, is what the book of Exodus is all about. The, the, the Hebrew people were already God's people at this point. They were the descendants of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. They belonged to the God of Scripture. But they were simultaneously enslaved in Egypt. That, there was an, uh, an, an incongruence there. They're God's people, but they're in slavery. And so God looked at them and motivated by their position, who they are to him, God does what he has to do to set them free, to rescue them. And so the first thing that I want to show you today is that God, or Yahweh, as he's revealed in Exodus, he is motivated by sonship. He, he does what he does because of sonship. So let's read our first passage together, and I'll show you what I mean. It says in verse 18 that Moses went back to Jethro. This is chapter 4, just so you can follow along. Went back to Jethro, his father-in-law, and said to him, please let me go back to my brothers in Egypt and see whether they are still alive. And Jethro said to Moses, go in peace. And if, if you're just picking up the study today, I'll remind you that in the previous episode, Moses had met with God at the bush that burned yet was not consumed. And God put a call on his life. So now he's left the wilderness, left that burning bush, and he goes to Jethro, his father-in-law, and asks for permission to leave. And the Lord, verse 19, said to Moses and Midian, go back to Egypt for all the men who were seeking your life are dead. So Moses took his wife and his sons and had them ride on a donkey and went back to the land of Egypt. And Moses took the staff of God in his hand. And the Lord, verse 21, said to Moses, when you go back to Egypt, see that you do before Pharaoh all the miracles that I have put in your power. But I will harden his heart so that he will not let the people go. Then you shall say to Pharaoh, thus says the Lord, Israel is my firstborn son. And, and I say to you, let my son go that he may serve me. If you refuse to let him go, behold, I will kill your firstborn son. Okay, so in this opening episode that we read today, uh, after meeting with God at the burning bush, Moses goes to his father-in-law, this guy named Jethro, or Ruel, and he asks him for permission to go back to uh, see his brothers in Egypt. Uh, I like the way that Moses asked for permission. Uh, he omitted a lot of details about like, you know, I was out there in the wilderness and he saw this bush that was burning but not consumed and the angel of the Lord was in the bush. He omitted all of that because he's probably thinking, Jethro's going to think I'm crazy if I give him all these details. So he just says, I want to go back to Egypt to see if my brothers are still alive. I want to check on the welfare of my extended family. And uh, Jethro gave Moses his blessing. Uh, then God... Yahweh restated his exhortation to Moses in verse 19. He said, go back to Egypt. And then God said something very interesting. He said, go back to Egypt for all the men who were seeking your life are dead. 
Now, knowing what we know about God from this book and outside of this book, this absolutely, positively cannot be God's way of saying, uh, I really couldn't handle those enemies, uh, so now that they're dead, the coast is clear, and I'm strong enough to deal with the new regime that is in place. God could deal with anybody at any time. So what is he saying to Moses here? I, I think what he's saying to Moses is, Moses, it's a new chapter. A chapter of your life has closed, that old chapter. There's a new regime in place. Everybody that knew, you knew is gone, and I'm going to do a new thing in your life. The process of deliverance is ready to begin. So Moses headed out with his wife, and we get a new little detail in verse 20. His family grew a little bit. Last time we saw him, he had one son. Now he has sons, plural, and we know later it's two boys. And if you've read the book of Genesis, there are some things that sound really similar to a major character in the book of Genesis, a man named Jacob. Uh, like Moses, Jacob had to flee to a foreign country under the threat of death. Like Moses, Jacob married a woman that he met first at a well. And like Moses, Jacob served his father-in-law, took care of his flocks, actually, for many years. Uh, both men had a promise that God would be with them and return them to their, uh, where they'd come from. And both men had to eventually part with, uh, from their father-in-law to reunite with their brothers. And as we'll see in a moment, both men were saved by the actions of their wives at some point. Uh, but there is a difference between Moses and Jacob. When Jacob left Laban's presence in the book of Genesis, he had 12 sons who eventually became the 12 patriarchs or the 12 name designations of the 12 tribes of Israel. He went out of Laban's presence with great possessions and with a big old family. But when Moses goes out of uh, Jethro's presence, he has a small little family. All he has is a donkey and the staff of God in his hand. I think that God is trying to hint at uh, a message here. He's saying Moses' family is back in Egypt. Moses' possessions are back in Egypt. Jacob came out with the 12 patriarchs, but the 12 tribes are there in Egypt, and Moses is going to go get his family. That's what's happening in this movement. Notice here that the Lord reminded uh, Moses that uh, Pharaoh would not receive him. That's what he tells him in verse 21. Uh, God had already told Moses that Pharaoh would not let Israel go unless compelled by a mighty hand. But here he says, I'm going to harden Pharaoh's heart in verse 21 so that he would, will not let the people go. And uh, when this hardness comes upon Pharaoh's heart, God tells Moses, uh, then you need to say to Moses, God says, let my son go that he may serve me. If you refuse to let him go, I'll kill your firstborn son. Now, there's a lot of questions about this whole first movement, uh, including, I think, questions about uh, the hardening of Pharaoh's heart. How did, how did that happen? How did God do that? It's clear as you read through the rest of the account that there are times that Pharaoh hardens his own heart. There are times that God is given credit for hardening his heart. It's very clear that Pharaoh has the ability to say yes to God, at least initially, but then he backtracks upon it. Uh, it's very clear that nobody needed to die in the plague of the firstborn son dying, but that Pharaoh's hardness of heart kept him from being able to submit to God. And we're going to get into the mysteries of that in coming teachings. But for now, I want you to notice a massive new development in the text. It's kind of like I wish that as we were reading the Bible, there was just like a little alarm that went off when we read a specific line that we just went through. Uh, God refers in this little paragraph that we read to the Hebrew people back in Egypt, still emerging as a nation. He calls them his first born son. Did you see that? This is, they are my firstborn son. And since Pharaoh had been persecuting God's firstborn son from the very beginning of this book, even commanding that their sons be thrown into the Nile River, God warned that a refusal to let his firstborn son go would result in the death of Pharaoh's firstborn son. There would be a trade. I need freedom for my firstborn son, and if you resist, it will cost you the life of your own firstborn son, God says to Pharaoh. The headline here is that God sees himself 
in a family relationship with the people of Israel. Collectively, the Hebrew men and the Hebrew women were, according to God, his firstborn son. The reason this is a big deal is because this is the first time that God is thought of as a father in the Bible, as a father in Scripture. We, we pray, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, but that was a new concept in this moment. God is first thought of as the father of his people. It's also important because many people have turned to the book of Exodus as an excuse for all kinds of activity, as, as if all the book of Exodus is saying is, God, when he sees injustice, hates it so much that he stoops to deal with it at all times. And there's a grain of truth in that reality, but what's happening here is God is saying, it's not just the travesty of their experience that is moving me. It is not just the slavery that they're enduring that is moving me. The thing that is moving me is that they are going through those things, and they're my kids. They're my children. They're my firstborn son. This concept is meant to present an obvious contradiction to every thinking person that reads this book. If the Hebrews are God's firstborn son, why are they suffering? And why are they enslaved? Why are they serving Pharaoh and not serving God? This is a problem to be fixed, and that's why God is moving here in the book of Exodus. He's drawing the people out so that they can be who they really are. As long as they were in slavery in Egypt, they were not acting like God's firstborn son. And so he needed to set them free so they could run in the identity that God had given to them. This is an important lesson for us to learn. God, in his work in our lives, he is so motivated by who we are in his sight. You know, the Bible teaches that when you become a Christian, when, when you, and when I say become a Christian, what I don't mean is uh, when you decide to tick all the official boxes, like I'm going to get a, a, a real Bible, and I'm going to uh, go to, I'm going to find a church, and I'm going to attend it. What I, what I mean by becoming a Christian is when, when you yield to Jesus. When you turn from your sin and repent of it and ask for him to forgive you and to cleanse you of all your unrighteousness, when you lean upon his righteousness completely rather than your own, when this event transpires in your life, the Bible teaches that the righteousness of Jesus is deposited into your account so that the Father sees you now as he sees his only begotten Son. You have a new identity, in other words, in him. And God is then looking at us and saying, that is how I see you. And so all the slavery that you're in, all the bondage that you're in, all the distraction that you're in, all the sin that you're still meddling with, I want to pull you out of that because it is not consistent with who you are in my sight. And I want the very best for you, so I'm going to work to produce exodus in your life so that you can be as you are. I'm not going to do this so you can become my child. I'm going to do this because you already are my child. It's just such an important thing for us to understand. God is motivated by the fact that we are his children. Uh, now, some of you might be sitting here today and saying like, okay, well, all right, God is calling them his firstborn son, and you keep using that uh, term, Nate, that's a, that's a, very, that's a male-oriented term. Why, why aren't we saying sons and daughters? Are, are the translations that do that kind of give us like gender-neutral language? Are they uh, hitting on something beautiful? You know, we are, after all, the sons and daughters of God. Don't you, don't you think that's true, Nate? Well, what I would say is that translations like that miss the theological point that God is making. God is saying, You're my, you have the position of my only begotten son. So male or female, when you come to know Jesus, you're receiving the position of the son. That's why God says to his church, you are as my firstborn son. And so God is motivated by that. He wants us to be in living in 
consist, consistently with uh, who we are, and he, he's motivated by that. I remember a few months ago, uh, it was in between uh, church services. I think it was just a random Sunday, but it happened to be a little stretch where my vocal cords weren't doing that good. So I, I bring to the church uh, this uh, steamer, and uh, it plugs in, you put a little bit of water in it, and it just produces this steam, and then you like put your face in it. It's got like this clear tube that you put your face in. It, if you're, I mean, being from California and having gone to Pacific Grove High School, it looks like you're doing something else uh, when you're hooked up to this thing. And I, so I was back behind the stage, and I was in between services. I'm doing this thing. There's steam everywhere and all that, and I'm just by myself. And Pastor Manny just wanted to see if I was okay. And so he just opened the door, and, like, the look on his face was just this look of shock. Like, what is Pastor Nate doing right now? And he just shut the door real quick. <laughs> and then he, I think he realized, like, if he is in there smoking weed, I need to deal with it. So he opens the door again, and he's like, okay, he's just steaming right now, you know. <laughs> that impulse was this impulse of, like, oh, that's not consistent with who he is. That's not consistent, and our Father in heaven, sorry for this little illustration, our Father in heaven, he looks at us and he says, there's who you are, and then there's your experience, and I want to bring your experience more fully in line with who you are in my sight. Okay, so that's the first thing. God, or Yahweh, is motivated by our sonship, but the second story, I think, helps us see that he wants us to be motivated by our sonship as well. Let's read verse 24 to 26 to get together. It says, at a lodging place on the way, you know, back to Egypt, the Lord met him, Moses, and sought to put him to death. Then Zipporah took a flint and cut off her son's foreskin and touched Moses' feet with it and said, surely you're a bridegroom of blood to me. So he let him alone. It was then that she said, a bridegroom of blood because of the circumcision. Now, there's probably no questions about this uh, passage. You probably, it's like, oh yeah, it makes sense. I get it. <laughs> this is one of those episodes that we like skip over in Calvary Kids, you know, we don't really bring, okay, class, today we want to talk to you about Zipporah and what she did for Moses. Uh, look, God is not dumb. He knows that stories like this, they're going to kind of jar us. They're on purpose. There's a, it's like, supposed to create this like what is happening feeling in the reader there's a fancy term for it it's called narrative dissonance you're like reading along you're like okay i know what happens next he goes to egypt and he does and then it's like god wants to kill moses and you're like whoa what's happening there's a lesson here that god is trying to bring to mind shocks us on a lot of levels i mean that first statement god sought to put moses to death by now, we know that God and Moses are like the ultimate tag team that are going to go into Egypt and body slam the Egyptians and Pharaoh. We know that. So we know Moses can't die. And God can't want Moses to be dead. I mean, that's just doesn't compute. And, uh, and then, of course, don't get me started on all the circumcision, foreskin, and bridegroom of blood talk. And when I was 18 years old and I felt the Lord calling me to be a preacher of the word, I just, I said yes, I should have read the fine print that I was going to have to talk about stuff like this. Okay, in the story, what, what's happening here? Moses and his little family, they're rolling along uh, with their donkey, and he's got his staff, and something happens. We don't know what it was, but something happens that tells them that Moses is in danger. They're at the lodge, maybe he's seizing, uh, maybe he's convulsing. Maybe he's stroking. Uh, but whatever happened, Zipporah, his wife, she knew why it was happening. And uh, she knew exactly what to do. And she's not the first woman in the book of Exodus to save Moses' life. She's in a long line of female saviors. And she quickly took a knife, circumcised her son, and threw the foreskin at Moses' feet, and then called Moses her bloody husband. That's basically what happens. Now, it's a, this is an old story, you know, 3,000 years old in an ancient book. So you can only imagine that there have been thousands and thousands of scholars that have tried to weigh in on this passage, trying to figure out what's happening. Lots of conjecture, lots of odd interpretations. 
There's a lot we don't know about this episode, but there are a couple of things that we do know. One thing that we do know is that circumcision somehow is at the center of this episode. I'm sorry, that might make us feel a little bit queasy, but there's a reason for that. But it's at the center of the episode. Uh, We also know that God gave Moses and Zipporah a chance to correct something that was off. Whatever was off, God gave them a moment to correct it. I mean, I think I could say it like this. This is... This is written in anthropomorphic terms, meaning human language to describe God's movements, the the acts of the divine. It says, like, God sought to put Moses to death. Don't you think, knowing what we know of God in the book of Exodus, that if he really wanted Moses dead, Moses would be like, you know, dead? (laughs) So it seems that the gap between the mood that is expressed is meant to convey something to Moses and Zipporah. It's like, we have an off-ramp. We have a chance. We have a moment right now where we could deal with an issue before it becomes a bigger problem in our lives. Uh, God had told Moses a lot of times already at this point who he was. He He over and over again, I mean, it's like ad nauseum. He says, I'm the God of who? Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. What he wanted was for Moses to act like who he was. He wanted Moses to act like he was in the line of his spiritual ancestors. And God had given to Abraham so many years earlier the outward sign for the male Hebrews of circumcision as a way to demonstrate the inward covenant that God had made with his people. And apparently Moses had not followed through with this for his own son. So what was Moses doing? Moses was not acting like a Hebrew. Moses was acting like an Egyptian. And he's about to go back to Egypt to deal with the Egyptians. And he can't be acting like an Egyptian when he's dealing with the Egyptians. He's got to be who God has made him to be. He's got to be a Hebrew man. And I think in some strange way, this episode reveals God's heart for us. Like I've been saying, he's motivated by our sonship. He wants us to act as we are. But he also wants us to be motivated by our sonship. God does what he does because of our position in him. But he wants us to do what we do because of our position in him as well. The Hebrew people, after hundreds of years in Egypt... And sometimes we talk about, you know, 400 plus years in Egypt. And sometimes you'll hear people say, sometimes I'll even slip and say, 400 plus years of slavery in Egypt. Look, it wasn't all bad. At the end, it became brutal. At the end, the Pharaoh became uh, uh, an adversary of the Israelites. But for a lot of years, centuries, they were living in peace. They were living in prosperity. And in times like that, A child of God can forget who they are. And so God is trying to remind Moses, this is who you are. You're going to go and lead a people who have forgotten who they are. You got to remember who you are so that you can remind them of who they are. God hates for us to experience less than his best. So he needed his man to live in his calling as a way to help others live in theirs. And God wants the same for us. He's paid the ultimate price so that we could be his children, so that we could be his sons, and he wants us to be motivated by that position that we have in him. You know, so many struggle for identity in our modern era, and so many are driven by a self-identity. We look within, and I'm going to talk about this in our next study of Exodus, but what God is saying is don't look within for who you truly are. Look to me for who you truly are. Hear from me who you are in my sight. Now, I also want to suggest that this episode might have really served as an important lesson for Moses. Uh, That might really be the significant thing that God is doing here is teaching Moses something important because Uh, There's an episode later on in the book of Exodus, you guys might remember this if you're familiar with Exodus, where Moses goes up to the mountaintop, to Mount Sinai, and he receives the Ten Commandments and the law of God. And what are the people doing down below while he's up there uh, with God? You guys remember this? They build a golden calf. And the Bible actually says they worshiped the Lord through this golden calf. 
And God's anger is aroused at them. And God has this conversation with Moses, tells him what's happening down below. And he says to Moses, let me destroy them. And I'll start over with you. I'll fulfill the promises of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob through you and your family. And Moses doesn't take the bait, and instead he cries out to God and says, God, have mercy on them. What, what's, what are the Egyptians going to say? What, what are the whole, what's the whole world going to say if you do that? And so he pleads for them, and God relents, and he has grace and mercy. And that, that's kind of the context where God reveals who he is to Moses. He says, I'm slow to anger. I'm gracious and merciful and abounding in loving kindness towards who? Towards golden calf worshipers. That's, that's how I am towards them. You're seeing what I'm really truly like right now, Moses. But maybe this episode was the episode that taught Moses when God reveals his anger, his revelation of his anger is also his revelation of an opportunity for his grace to be dispensed. He, he would have remembered it from this episode. And then when God says to him, I'm angry about these, Baal, these uh, golden calf worshipers down there, Moses could have said to himself, oh, I remember. When God expresses what he is angry about, it's an opportunity for me to receive his love, his grace, his mercy, and his kindness. And so I gotta pray for that. So maybe that's what God is doing in this moment with Moses. But again, God wants us to act as we are. He doesn't want us to settle. He wants us to be who we are, called and chosen and adopted and loved and new because we are his sons. J.I. Packer said it this way. He said, just as the knowledge of his unique sonship controlled Jesus's living of his own life on earth, and that's very true. Jesus did everything that he did because of a consciousness of who he was in his father's sight. So he insists that the knowledge of our adoptive sonship must control our lives too. We got, we got to remember who we are and be motivated by that ourselves. Okay, the last thing I want to look at today is how um, God or Yahweh's sons must be redeemed. And we're going to just read a big chunk right here. So if you didn't do your devos today, if you didn't have Bible reading time, you're about to have one with me right now. So just follow along verse 27 of chapter 4. And we're going to go all the way through chapter 5. The Lord said to Aaron, <clears throat> go into the wilderness to meet Moses. So he went and met him at the mountain of God and kissed him. And Moses told Aaron all the words of the Lord with which he had sent him to speak, and all the signs that he had commanded him to do. Then Moses and Aaron went and gathered together all the elders of the people of Israel. Aaron spoke all the words that the Lord had spoken to Moses and did the signs in the sight of the people, and the people believed. And when they heard that the Lord had visited the people of Israel and that he had seen their affliction, they bowed their heads and worshiped. So it's going good. Afterward, Moses and Aaron, verse 1, went and said to Pharaoh, Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, let my people go that they may hold a feast to me in the wilderness. But Pharaoh said, who is the Lord that I should obey his voice and let Israel go? I do not know the Lord, and moreover, I will not let Israel go. Then they said, verse 3, the God of the Hebrews has met with us. Please let us go a three days journey into the wilderness that we may sacrifice to the Lord our God, lest he fall upon us with pestilence or with the sword. But the king of Egypt said to them, Moses and Aaron, why do you take the people away from their work? Get back to your burdens. And Pharaoh said, Behold, the people of the land are now many, and you make them rest from their burdens. The same day, Pharaoh commanded the taskmasters of the people and their foremen, You shall no longer give the people straw to make bricks as in the past. Let them go and gather straw for themselves. With the number of bricks that they make in the past, you shall impose on them. You shall by no means reduce it, for they are idle. Therefore they cry, let us go and sacrifice to our, offer sacrifice to our God. Let heavier work be laid on the men, that they may labor at it and pay no regard to lying words. So the taskmasters, verse 10, and the foremen of the people went out and said to the people, thus says Pharaoh, I will not give you straw. Go and get your straw yourselves wherever you can find it, but your work will not be reduced in the least. So the people were scattered throughout all the land of Egypt to gather stubble for straw. The taskmasters were urgent, saying, complete your work, your daily task each day, as when there was straw. And the foremen of the people of Israel, whom Pharaoh's taskmasters had set over them, were beaten and were asked, why have you not done all your task of making bricks today and yesterday as in the past? 
Then the foreman of the people of Israel, verse 15, came and cried to Pharaoh, why do you treat your servants like this? No straw is given to your servants, yet they say to us, make bricks, and behold, your servants are beaten, but the fault is in your own people. But he said, you are idle, you are idle, that is why you say, let us go and sacrifice to the Lord. Go now and work, no straw will be given you, but you must still deliver the same number of bricks. And the foremen of the people of Israel saw that they were in trouble when they said, you shall by no means reduce your number of bricks, your daily task each day. They met Moses and Aaron, verse 20, who were waiting for them as they came out from Pharaoh. And they said to them, the Lord look on you and judge, because you have made us stink in the sight of Pharaoh and his servants and have put a sword in their hand to kill us. Then Moses turned to the Lord and said in verse 22, O Lord, why have you done evil to this people? Why did you ever send me? For since I came to Pharaoh to speak in your name, he has done evil to this people, and you have not delivered your people at all. Okay, in this really long passage that we just read, Moses and Aaron, they finally meet with Pharaoh. It's a dramatic meeting, uh, just like we would expect. Pharaoh was considered, I don't know if you guys know this, he was considered the ultimate god in Egypt. Uh, he was not like an elected official with polling data that revealed his popularity. Like, what do you think of the current Pharaoh? Approve or disapprove? <laughs> they thought he's the child of the sun. He's our God. He's the number one. There's an ancient inscription attributed to Pharaoh that reads, I am that which was and is and shall be, and no man has lifted my veil. Okay, that's the guy that Moses goes in and commands uh, to set Israel free. And I know some of you right now, you're imagining some uh, artistic expression of this, maybe like a Disney movie or something like that, where it's like he's rolling in and he's like, Ramses, remember me, bro? We used to race chariots together back in the day. We have no idea which Pharaoh this was. It's been 40 years. The idea is it's an impressive man, and in, 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 a, in a, 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 an, an awe-inspiring moment as Moses goes in. And he says, on behalf of the Lord, he says, God says, let my people go, that they may hold a feast in the wilderness. That's all he wanted. This is not a request for full-scale freedom yet. It's just like a, a week or so to go worship their God. The, the Egyptian people were used to this kind of thing. They had all kinds of religious festivals. Uh, but it's clear that this Pharaoh did not feel about the Hebrew people like the last Pharaoh at the beginning. Remember the last Pharaoh? He looked at the numbers of the Hebrews and he felt threatened. He's like, we gotta decrease their numbers because they're gonna rise up against us. This Pharaoh saw them as an asset to be managed. He's like, these people are pumping out bricks to help me build my empire. Uh, they can't stop working for even a day. So no, the people cannot go. So he reply, replied with sarcasm in verse 2, this crazy question. He says, who is the Lord that I should obey his voice and let Israel go? And in a sense, you could say, that's really what the rest of Exodus is about. Pharaoh is asking, who is the Lord? And all of us reading it are like, bro, you're about to find out. <laughs> you should not have asked that question. <laughs> you should not have taken that posture or that tone. Now, as a side note, when you see in your Bibles there the word Lord, in all caps, uh, that means that the translators of that English Bible or, or version are translating the name Yahweh, which is related to the I am statement of God that we looked at last week in chapter three. When God said he is I am, he used Hebrew phrasing connected to the name Yahweh. And like I said, the rest of the book is gonna reveal who Yahweh is. Now this is where we should highlight that this has now become officially a battle between the gods. Who's the true God? Is it Pharaoh or is it Yahweh? Now, we know the outcome of the books and we know the answer, but even at this point in the narrative, there's a clue. Uh, it, it's funny, but we never get the name of this Pharaoh. From history, we know the name of lots of Pharaohs, including Pharaohs during this era, but scholars cannot be sure which Pharaoh it is that squares off uh, with God in the pages to follow. As hard as we try, and as much as nearly every scholarly commentary on Exodus tries to figure out the identity of this Pharaoh, 
We cannot know with certainty who this Pharaoh was. Uh, but the question or the, the thing that should stand out to us is that in this book, God is perfectly fine with telling us the names of people. When they're the Hebrew midwives, he's like, oh, one was named Shiphrah, the other was named Pua. When it comes to uh, Moses' parents, oh, yeah, Amram and Jochebed. When it comes to Moses' siblings, oh, yeah, Aaron and Miriam. Like, he is just perfectly fine mentioning people's names, but he never says the name of Pharaoh. That's the thing that should stand out to us. It should stand out to us that for generations, echoing throughout history, Pharaoh's question, who is the Lord, reverberates. But God's question and response is, who's Pharaoh? Who's Pharaoh? It's like God is saying, this man is so worthy of judgment because of the way that he has positioned himself as divine over people I made, that his name is not even worthy of being recorded in my book. That's, I think, what we should hear from the absence of this man's name. But Pharaoh's initial strategy was to make the people's work more intense. So he tells them, no more straw. That was important. You take straw, chop it up finely, put it in with mud, and then bake bricks in that way. And so he tells them, you apparently have time on your hands if you want to go worship. So now you can get the straw yourself. And uh, this whole battle between God and Pharaoh, it's clear. When the taskmasters and the foremen come to the people with that announcement and they say, thus says Pharaoh, I will not give you straw. What did, what did Moses say to, to Pharaoh? Thus says the Lord. Now it's thus says Pharaoh. Pharaoh's saying, I don't care what your God says. This is what I say. And Pharaoh, of course, is not the last biblical figure to have this kind of posture before God. There are all kinds of kings and leaders throughout scripture and human history that have taken this kind of posture, this kind of arrogant stance before God. Sennacherib of the Assyrians, uh, he said, I've killed every God of every other nation that I've gone up against. The Hebrew God will be no different. And they lost. Uh, ba uh, Nebuchadnezzar in Babylon said, who is the Lord and how's he going to help these three Hebrews that have rebelled against my commission? Nothing can save them from my fires. Uh, over and over again. Uh, there was a king in the book of Ezekiel from Tyre who Ezekiel rebuked for acting and feeling that he was divine. Pontius Pilate tells Jesus, I have the power over your life. Life or death, it comes from me. Uh, Herod, in the book of Acts, dies a gruesome death because he receives worship from the villagers in that region. And the book of Revelation details the catastrophic end in cataclysmic chaos of kings and rulers who position themselves against Yahweh. And that's just in the Bible. Outside of Scripture, history is littered with stories of pompous leaders who elevated themselves before caving into terrible ruin. So these foremen, uh, they are cry out to Pharaoh and Moses and Aaron, and they say, you've made us stink in God's sight. They blame Moses and blame Aaron. And, uh, you know, one kind of wonders, did, did Moses, you know, he'd heard this isn't going to go great. <laughs> did he tell them? Seems like he hadn't. Seems like he forgot. In fact, he goes back to God, and he begins blaming God. I, I love Moses' prayers. It's, it's, like, it's like he drinks truth serum before he prays, <laughs> just like he says the rawest things to God. He says to God, like, You're, you blew it. I wish you'd have never sent me. You know, this is not working. You have failed your people. But the point is that God is in the process of redeeming his sons. And when God works redemption in someone's life, it's not something that he takes lightly. God is not a God who enjoys competition. God wants to be alone in devotion and worship and praise because it is the best thing for us. The Egyptians needed judgment. The whole situation needed to be crushed. And God was going to allow events to culminate so that the full redemption he desired could come to pass. Sometimes we say things like, it always has to get worse before it gets better. You ever said something like that? With God, it always has to get worse before it gets better. But I want you to understand, 
It doesn't always have to get worse, but when it does get worse before it gets better, a lot of times it's because there are things that we need to be redeemed from, and God is going to war to make sure that when the redemption comes, it is full and complete and final. Uh, He's not satisfied with these little partial victories. He wants the whole thing. So in the chaos, often he's teeing up a victory that is coming. So the questions we might ask as we wrap up today are, what things distract us from him? What things cloud our minds and overrun our habits? What things do we worship other than him? And like the Hebrews in their slavery, what identities have paralyzed us from running in the sonship that he has destined us to enjoy. God is at war with all of those things so that he might bring us more fully into himself.